Hello, I'm W. Clark Gilpin. I'm uh, an emeritus professor of American religious history at the University of Chicago Divinity School, where I taught from 1984 to 2011. Uh, today, I'm going to be speaking about uh, a book by William James, published in 1902, entitled The Varieties of Religious Experience, A Study in Human Nature. A striking simile from the social historian E.J. Hobsbawm identifies a pivotal transition that occurred during the early decades of the 19th century in the way that Americans have thought about the world in which they lived. Sometime during those decades, Hobsbawm writes, religion ceased to be something like the sky and instead became something like a bank of clouds, uh, a large but limited and changing feature of the human firmament. With this simile, Hobsbawm calls attention not only to a change in the social role of religion, but also to a shift in the perspective of, uh, on religion adopted by his implicit observer. Whereas the religious sky had provided the encompassing frame of reference within which reflection on human nature and conduct began, religion as a bank of clouds functioned in a wider pattern of forces and took on meaning from its inter interrelations with other environmental factors. Religion in this bank of clouds era participated in a highly differentiated social system composed of distinct spheres, many of which operated independently from any explicitly religious interpretation or justification. Politics, law, and government, including war and international relations, economics, commerce, communications, science, medicine, technology, education, literature, and the arts, family, gender relations, ethnicity, and race. In the years from the 1860s to the 1930s, from the end of the Civil War to the Great Depression, this societal transition became a defining intellectual process of modernity. And the central social fact that shaped the modern study of religion and modern ways of being religious. The philosopher William James, uh, who lived from 1842 to 1910, better than any other figure of this era, represents this transition and its consequences for American understandings of religion. It is no accident that more than a century after its publication, his book, The Varieties of Religious Experience, A Study in Human Nature, remains one of the most influential books about religion ever written by an American. The book opens a window into a crucial transitional era of American social history and into the beginnings of the academic study of religion in the United States. William James was formally trained as a physician and was a member of the Department of Philosophy at Harvard at a time when psychology was just beginning to separate itself from philosophy. In fact, an excellent uh, older book of, about this era by the Yale historian John E. Smith entitled Themes in American Philosophy describes William James as a philosophical psychologist. James, uh, along with the philosophers Charles Sanders Peirce and John Dewey, was uh, preeminent in the movement in philosophy known as pragmatism during the first part of the 20th century. His father, Henry James, was a friend of Ralph Waldo Emerson and fascinated by the transcendentalism 
of early 19th century New England. William James's brother was the younger Henry James, one of the most prominent American novelists of the era. The varieties of religious experience was presented as the Gifford, the prestigious Gifford lectures in Scotland in 1901 and 1902. These lectures had been established at the universities of Edinburgh, Glasgow, St. Andrews, and Aberdeen to, uh, in the words of the donor, promote and diffuse the study of natural theology in the widest sense of the term. In other words, the knowledge of God. James emphatically approached the 20 lecture series uh, as a psychologist. And he uh, focused on the idea that his approach would be to look at religion in all its varieties as beginning in personal religious experience. Uh, it seems to me that Hobsbawm's image of the transition from sky to bank of clouds aptly identifies the way James located religious experience in the general range of human experience of this era. He writes, uh, James writes, religious phenomena were best understood and evaluated when they were considered as special kinds or cases of human experience of much wider scope. Religious mel melancholy, whatever peculiarities it may have as religious, is at any rate melancholy. Religious happiness is happiness. Religious trance is trance. Who does not see that we are likely to ascertain the distinctive significance of religious mel melancholy and happiness and trance when we compare them as conscientiously as we can to other varieties of melancholy, happiness, and trance, and not by refusing to consider their place in any more general series. This is a bank of clouds religion in the larger sky of a general human experience. Thus, it seems to me, says James, to be no one elementary religious emotion, but only a common storehouse of emotions upon which religious objects may draw. So there might conceivably also prove to be no one specific and essential kind of religious object, and no one specific and essential kind of religious act. How then do we approach this uh, location of religion within the vast range of human experience of the social and physical world. He begins with uh, this, through his focus on personal religious experience, with this definition. Religion, as he wishes to explore it, is, and I'm quoting, the feelings, acts, and experiences of individual men in their solitude, so far as they apprehend themselves to stand in relation to whatever they may consider the divine. Let me give you two examples of this uh, apprehension of what they considered the divine that come not from uh, James's book, but from my own reading. The first is from uh, the New England transcendentalist Margaret Fuller, who in 1843 took a trip through the Great Lakes over the course of a summer, landed in what's now Chicago, and traveled westward through the prairies of, west of Illinois. Fuller's initial reaction to Illinois was that it was unbelievably 
dreary. Gradually, as she walked the terrain, as she encountered both indigenous people and the buried just beneath the surface remains of their ancestors, she began to look more carefully at what she thought, what she saw, and how she thought about it. It was now, looking out across that prairie, a limitless horizon, striking in its beauty. It was an encircling vastness. And she concludes her experience of the Illinois prairie by reversing that earlier notion of it as dreary to say, what is limitless is alone divine. Two features here that uh, are important to recognize. On the one hand, that a sensation of the view of that limitless horizon of the prairie is uh, imaginatively extrapolated into a way of thinking about reality as a whole. What is limitless is alone divine. Second, something we'll come back to later in this conversation, is that uh, it represents a change of perspective on Fuller's part. What had been dreary is now consolidated into a limitless horizon of personal poss possibility. Another feature of this uh, experience, this sensation of one's relationship to the world is that uh, in James's view, it can come and it can go. It's not, it's vital, but it's, it's fragile. And my example there comes from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who made a regular habit of traveling, walking each afternoon through the woods and fields of his native Massachusetts, thinking, uh, making notes as he wrote, uh, experiencing nature. But one day he writes in his journal, I found myself, as he's walking, I found myself not wholly present there. It was as if a symphony had been playing but a few minutes before, and now there was silence. His sense of connection to the universe, his sense of concentration, his sense of attentiveness to nature that disclosed its wholeness and its relationship to him and its way of shaping his self has disappeared. I found myself not wholly present there. Considering these experiences of religion, uh, these sensations of the wholeness of the world, um, William James begins to revise that initial definition I read to you um, and to rethink what it was he wanted to say about uh, what religion uh, was distinctive in apprehending in our world. He writes, gods are conceived to be the first things in the way of being and power. They overarch and envelop, and from them there is no escape. Religion might thus be defined as one's attitude toward whatever is felt to be most primal and enveloping and deeply true. One might say that religion is a man's total reaction upon life. James draws back from that conclusion, however, because he sees that some person's total reaction on life is one of uh, 
resignation to the mere finitude of human life. We come, we go, we have no permanent consequence here. Our meaning is ephemeral. Or they are people for whom uh, this life in the finite world is a source of irony uh, or even a source of jokes. He therefore shifts his definition slightly but importantly. Religion, but if hostile to light irony, religion is equally hostile to heavy grumbling and complaint. And so, he wants to say, the divine, the divine shall mean for us only such a primal reality as the individual feels impelled to respond to solemnly and gravely and neither by a curse nor a jest. This notion, uh, together with his earlier definition, pushes James in the next key section of the varieties to think about that transition through which people pass in which they apprehend some defining feature of the experienced world and through it develop a sense of meaning purpose uh, and personal energy in relation to engagement with that world. This is a series of uh, chapters uh, on what he calls the divided self and the process of its unification. Um, and he asks you to, uh, as, as a listener at the lecture, to imagine a particular kind of experience. Conceive yourself, he says, if possible, suddenly stripped of all the emotion with which your world now inspires you, and try to imagine it as it exists purely by itself without your favorable or unfavorable, hopeful or apprehensive comment. It will be almost impossible for you, re for you to realize such a condition of negativity and deadness. No other portion of the universe would then have importance beyond another. And the whole collection of its things and series and events would be without significance, character, expression, or perspective. Whatever of value, interest, or meaning with which our personal worlds may appear endowed are thus pure gifts of the spectator's mind. The practically real world for each of us, the effective world of the individual, is the compound world, the physical facts and the emotional values in indistinguishable concentration. In that combination of emotional engagement with the facts of life, he finds that humans develop a center of personal energy, a phrase that he repeats over and over again in this book, a center of personal energy in which uh, their life is ordered and by which it is rendered meaningful. And it is this uh, engagement with the world, this sensation of the world as an emotional experience that uh, is the indispensable feature of the religions. For that reason, he wants to focus on the arrival, the movement of a divided self toward unity of sense of self and relationship with the world. The human interior, he writes, is a battleground. And the evolution of personal character consists of straightening out and unifying the inner self, the higher and lower feelings, 
the useful and the erring impulses begin by being a comparative chaos within us. They must end by forming a stable function, system of functions, in right subordination. To find religion is only one of many ways of reaching this unity and the process of remedying the inner incompleteness and reducing the inner discord is a general psychological process which may take place with any sort of material and need not necessarily assume the religious form. Religious regeneration is only one species of a genus of unification that includes other types of self-unification as well. Nonetheless, for James, religion does in fact draw out one feature of this process that he wishes to emphasize. And that is uh, that we not only are moving toward unification by our will, by our determination, by the decisions we make, by the parts of the world we choose to engage, and the parts we choose to ignore. There also are these moments when uh, the world engages us, when its interests or a specific dimension of its interests capture us and reorganize the way we think. In a telling phrase, he writes, an idea to be suggestive must come to the individual with the force of a revelation. And in those moments of revelation, in those moments when the world addresses us rather than us deciding to address the world, we find that uh, the self, and here he has innumerable religious examples from Islam, from Catholicism, from Protestantism, we experience a self-surrender to that engagement. In the great majority of all cases, when the will has done its uttermost toward bringing one close to complete unification aspired after, it seems that the very last step must be left to other forces and performed without the help of personal agency. In other words, self-surrender becomes indispensable. When the new center of personal energy has been sub subconsciously incubated so long as to be just ready to open into flower, hands off is the only word for us. It must burst forth unaided. So religion takes this process of unification in James's view and introduces this idea that we are not simply engaging the world but that certain features of the world engage us, revolutionize how we view the whole. We have those experiences like Margaret Fuller on the Illinois prairie when she suddenly realizes that the limitless is alone divine. So a question arises in my mind, and I think probably in many people's minds, how does this text inform our present day thinking? Why might someone turn to this text today? And I want to uh, think about that uh, in some ways as a response to a common criticism of James, that he approaches religion in too individualistic a way, that he doesn't take proper care and consciousness of ritual, of liturgy, of traditional theological ideas, of uh, social community. This is, after all, uh, the experience of individual men in their solitude 
according to him. I'd like to push back a little bit and say no, although uh, it may be too implicit and not explicit enough, this text, in fact, uh, has a lot to say about the human social relation to the world. Uh, and it does so by proceeding out of personal experience. But by no means does it ignore the social contexts in which that personal experience arises. And this is most evident in uh, the longest portion of the book. The series of five lectures out of the 20 total that he delivered as the Gifford Lectures that are on the topics of saintliness and the value of saintliness. I'll list four things that I think need our attention today and make reflecting on James well worthwhile. First, he's struck by the fact that uh, this element of seeing the world in a new way includes an element uh, or a, a series of practices of renunciation, of asceticism, uh, of distance from uh, the everyday concerns of this worldly life. The world is full of experiences, responsibilities, duties, expectations, norms that saintliness steps back from and assesses and in many cases renounces. The act of poverty, for instance, he regards as an act of freedom from the human sense that we are measured and valued by our commercial success. He's speaking, after all, in the Gilded Age of American history. And so religion as saintliness, as behavior, has a crucial purpose of challenging the implicit values of an industrializing, commercializing society and say no in poverty, in dismissal of worldly success, I find freedom. It's a critical freedom not simply a uh, departure, but a resistance. Secondly, the factors that fix the figure of a deity or a prophet or a seer, according to James, are founded in their ability to communicate their sense, our sense that they are communicating something of value to me personally. We're able to use their witness to shape, guide, unify our own lives. When we cease to admire or approve James writes, when we cease to admire or approve what the definition of a deity implies, we end by deeming that deity incredible. Nonetheless, he says, dogmatism and the outward form of inalterable certainty is so precious to some people, that to renounce it explicitly is for them out of the question. But surely, surely, he says, the safe thing is to recognize that all the insights of creatures of a day like ourselves must be provisional. 
The fact of diverse judgments about religious phenomena is therefore entirely inescapable, whatever we may desire to attain the irreversible. Our insights, our sense of the unity of the world, uh, the saintly characters that model what that might be are all contingent, provisional, and unless our engagement with the world acknowledges that provisional character of what has unified us, we cannot continue to change, grow, and maintain a sense of our own coherence and the coherence of the world in which we live. It's important to insist on the distinction between religion as an individual personal function and religion as an institutional, corporate, or as James says, tribal product. The religious experience which we are studying, he writes, is that which lives within the private breast. First-hand individual experience of this kind has always has appeared as a heretical sort of innovation to those who witnessed its birth. Naked comes it into the world and lonely. And it has always, for a time at least, driven him who had it into the wilderness. The experiences of individual men in their solitude, he had begun his definition of religion. And that solitude is a space of innovation and critical insight as he sees it. It is a wilderness where we see things that many others do not, and in fact a space where we see things that those who choose an unchangeable set of ideas or practices resist, resent, and oppose. Fourth, in many ways, these uh, first three things come together in mystical experience. And James's remarks on mysticism are in some ways uh, among the most interesting features to me of the entire book. The mystical consciousness, he says, may be methodically cultivated as an element and is methodically cultivated as an element in all of the major world religions. And he offers uh, a kind of synopsis in his book of uh, the practical fruits of this religious experience of the mystical connection to the world or to the divine that he finds in Islam, Judaism, and the forms of Christianity and Buddhism. The incommunicableness of the transport, the mystical transport into another non-temporal realm. The incommunicableness of the transport is the keynote of all mysticism. Mystical truth exists for the individual who has the transport, but for no one else. In this, as I have said, it resembles the knowledge given to us in sensations more than the knowledge given by conceptual thought. Mysticism is a sensation before it cultivates ideas as secondary uh, fruits of the experience itself. For mystics such as John of the Cross or Teresa of Avila, mystical experiences form new centers of spiritual energy that may have powerful practical consequences. It must always remain an open question whether mystical states may not possibly be such superior points of view, windows through which the mind looks out upon a more extensive and inclusive world. 
The mystical experience carries with it an imaginative, artistic, aesthetic component. Mystical experiences, he says, offer us hypotheses, hypotheses which we may voluntarily ignore, but which as thinkers we cannot possibly upset. The supernaturalism and optimism to which they would persuade us may be interpreted in one way or another, after all, as the truest insights into the meaning of this life. The mystical hypothesis, the imaginative projection. James, in another characteristic phrase that he uh, repeats several times, speaks of religion as opening up the background of possibilities. The background of possibilities. And mysticism, in his version, has the key role of generating that sensation that in turn generates hypotheses about the world, about our engagement with it, that uh, create that background of possibilities, that sense of hopefulness about a future that is not yet, that is beyond temporally who we are at this moment in our lives. This series of four things, I think, uh, is very much still with us in our contemporary world. And certainly, uh, I'd have to say personally, consideration of these things is very much with me. And James uh, is the thinker who, at least for me, has launched these questions provisionally, right? We're not finished yet. But uh, this uh, suggests or has suggested to me that one way to define uh, religion uh, that gives a little more attention than, uh, than James does to the uh, communal, the social, the traditional aspects of religion is to say that religions are evolving traditions forming a distinctive attentiveness to the world. And that distinctive attentiveness is, as James so eloquently describes it, a deeply personal and almost infinitely varied attentiveness. But the resources for helping us listen to the world, ignore some features and focus on others, that is the role of the larger communal, traditional religion as institution and as idea. These two things are in reciprocal relationship. James, however, is right that especially in our modern world where we can choose to be religious or choose not to be, this sense that uh, attentiveness is both trained but only personally experienced continues to me the whole truth. In thinking about uh, this text, which I've read off and on over 50 years, um, I was particularly attracted to three books that I'd like to recommend to people who want to know more, explore more, think more, both about William James and with William James. The first of these is, uh, and all, all three of these, I should say, were written right at the turn from the late 1990s to the early 2000s, at a moment when American scholars were significantly and creatively engaged 
with the question of the secular and of secularization and the relation between the secular and the religious. And for that reason returned, uh, again, in very creative and incisive ways to the era of William James. The first of the books I want to recommend is by Louis Menon. It's entitled The Metaphysical Club, A Story of Ideas in America. The focus of that story from Menon is the period from the end of the Civil War to the end of World War I. And it therefore places William James in a general intellectual climate uh, that informs us about how th James was thinking and with whom he was thinking. Secondly, uh, a book I brought with me, uh, written by another uh, of the Gifford lecturers, Charles Taylor. It's entitled, Varieties of Religion Today, William James Revisited, published by Harvard University Press in 2002. Again, I think uh, an incisive contemporary reappraisal of William James on the centennial of publication of the varieties of religious experience. And finally, uh, a scholar who, like James, wants you to dive into the personal experiences of both voluntary and involuntary religious emotion, affect, insight. Anne Taves, who wrote a remarkable book in 1999 entitled Fits, Trances, and Visions, Experiencing Religion and Explaining Experience from Wesley to James. I think these three books uh, create an environment for you to think about James and to find him newly stimulated as you consider both being religious and studying religion in contemporary American society. Thank you. Mm -hmm.